thank you so much, Nicole, for joining us today. And I'm going to ask you a few questions about your life as an activist, which I know goes way back. The first one is... Just a couple months. <laughs> what event or beliefs in your youth led you to become an activist? Well, I think the, the long and short of it is I started transitioning when I was in elementary school. And there was not really any information about really trans people, but trans children especially. Um, so, so my parents and the school had to really work together to try to figure out how best to navigate this. And so we started very gradual, you know, it's like, okay, kind of this year you can start wearing pink. This year you can start growing your hair out a little bit. And it was working really, really well. And it wasn't until I was in fifth grade, I'd fully transitioned at this point. There really weren't any major problems. Uh, we had a student come into my class and his grandfather was a member of this special interest Christian right group. And they didn't think that my using the girl's bathroom was okay. So he used his grandson as a political pawn and had him follow me into the girl's bathroom as a, as a statement saying, you know, my grandpappy says that we don't have to have any faggots in our school. The group was simultaneously threatening the school with a lawsuit, you know, kind of saying, oh, well, why can this boy use the girls' bathroom, but this boy can't? And the school said, okay, well, if Nicole using the girls' bathroom is the issue, then Nicole doesn't have to use the girls' bathroom. So they pulled me out and they stuck me in the staff bathroom isolating me from the rest of the students and sending a message to the community that said, hey, here's this student who is so different from the rest of you that she cannot be allowed to exist in the same public spaces as you. It just, it continued to escalate to the point where, where I had a bodyguard following me around making sure I was using the right bathroom. And I think the last straw for us was a, um, an outing club trip that we were, that I was set to go on. We were so excited. It was an overnight white water rafting trip. They said, well, Nicole can go, but she can't sleep in the same tent as the other girls. And mind you, these were girls who I had slept in the same bed as, you know, sleepovers for the past five years. What if we get a permission slip? from all the other parents and everyone kind of signs on and says they're okay with this. No, 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 that's not gonna work, that can't work. The school had no interest in working with us anymore. So my brother and my mom and I moved two hours south to Portland from Orno and we had to leave my dad behind so he could keep his job at the university so we would have a place to live, so we would have some kind of income. And for the next six years, we didn't live with our father. And I had to go in the closet in this new school because we were so terrified that, you know, what had happened in Orno was going to happen in Portland. Because of course, every school says like, oh, we have a zero tolerance policy on bullying. Because it's so easy to say like, oh, we take this super seriously and we have zero tolerance because a zero tolerance policy on bullying to me is immediate suspension. They're like, okay, well, we gave him detention. I'm like, he didn't even go to detention. I went stealth for two years and we decided to file suit on the grounds of unlawful discrimination. Um, because as of 2007 in the Maine Human Rights Act, you know, it said that sexual orientation and gender identity were a protected class. And so legally the school could not do what they did. That took five years before that case was settled and it went to the Maine State Supreme Court. That was the first time that a Supreme Court had ruled in favor of a transgender family. And so it set a precedent for the country. My family story is, is special in that it is in no way special at all. And it is in no way specific to our experience. Almost every trans kid I've talked to and every parent of a trans child I've talked to have a story similar to this. Bathrooms are kind of the battleground for civil rights issues. There's always, in every civil rights case, there's always something about a bathroom. So it set a precedent. And so for all of the other cases like this that do go to court, you know, those justices in those courtrooms can kind of say, okay, well, this is what happened in Maine. 
And so we don't have to be the first to decide which side of the fence this is going to fall on. And so all of that kind of set me on this path to activism and kind of showed me how to fight for myself and how to, to advocate for myself. But I think my first real taste of activism was when I was in eighth grade, I was still stealth. There was a bill proposed to the main state legislature called LD 1046. And it was like, it was very similar to Carolina's HB2 bill. It was, it's, it was your run of the mill average trans people are scary bathroom bill. And it, it was, and that's all, that's all caps and trademark, by the way, trans people are scary bathroom bill. It was pretty much saying, okay, you have to use the bathroom of your biological sex. And at this point I was still using the girl's bathroom, but I was stealth. So if this bill had passed, I would have to out myself to my entire school and start using the men's bathroom again, looking like this. My father and Equality Maine and the ACLU of Maine and the Maine Women's League had all been working at the state house and they'd all been trying to lobby against this bill and they weren't really getting anywhere. And so they had the idea to bring me in and they said, okay, well, I think they need to meet Nicole. And so I took two days off of school and I went to the Maine state house in the Capitol and I just talked to every representative that I could stop in the hallway. Trying to pour your heart out to somebody in the two minutes they're walking from here to there. And especially when you're a 12 year old trans girl, they really don't want to talk to you. And so I walked up to essentially a bunch of old straight white dudes and said, you know, hi, my name's Nicole. I'm 12. I'm transgender. Please care. I, I told them exactly why this bill would be harmful. I, I explained to them, please don't, please vote against this bill. I do not want to be put back in the men's bathroom. After two days, um, they, the, the bill was defeated and, and we managed to change the mind of a lot of people who had originally supported the bill. Why would so many people originally support this bill and then change their mind? And it kind of occurred to me that it's so much easier to marginalize a group of people when it's a faceless, nameless group. And it's so much easier to sweep marginalized identities under the rug when you don't have to look them in the face while you're doing it. When they were, when they met me and they were able to put a name, put a face to this group that we have been kind of taught is, you know, through media and through television and movies, we have been taught that transgender people are, you know, <laughs> middle-aged men in dresses. And it's something to find scary, gross, and funny. And we're supposed to laugh at it. It's not something deserving of our respect. I think when they met me and it was so not this scary thing that they've heard about on Fox News, they were kind of like, okay, I understand where I'm wrong here. And they understood why this 12 year old girl should not be forced to go into the men's bathroom and why that would be unsafe for her. And that was really my first instance of recognizing how powerful my voice was and how powerful sharing our stories is and saying, this is who I am. This is my story. Do with that what you will. I always appreciate how you want to hear other people's stories as well as wanting to share your own story. And I think the power of story is really incredible. All we, all people have are our stories, our individual stories. And that's how we connect with other people. So what continues to motivate you and guide you and give you courage? One of the biggest motivators is just seeing all of the work that still needs to be done. Having seen that we can affect change because now Orno is like this really great safe town for LGBTQ people. And, 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 and from what I've heard, cause you know, I have eyes everywhere. Policies are really up to date and the school is great for queer kids now. So I've seen it do a full 180. So I know it's possible. And I know that if 
by sharing our stories, sharing our truths and doing the work that you can change people's minds and you can change the climate somewhere. I think the hard part is feeling like it's impossible because so many folks want to dig their heels in the ground and they really want to die on this hill of nope, trans people don't matter. So that's the hard part and seeing how big the enemy feels sometimes. And I mean, especially right now, I think with the entire presidential administration working against trans identities and trans bodies, it feels very like, well, what can I do? But I still see change happening. And, and, we, and we see the Supreme Court ruling in favor of LGBTQ workers and LGBTQ employees. And we see all of the representation still happening in television and all of the new representation coming out. And I mean, we're having trans superheroes now. And, it, and it's like, we're still making progress despite Trump being in office and despite all of his best attempts. Once somebody can put a face to an issue, it changes people's perspective. I, say, I mean, my dad says it, it's 95% of people are good people. It's just that a lot of them don't know it yet. And there's, of course, there's that 5% of people that, that, that aren't good. They're not going to change their mind. They are determined to, 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 to hurt other people. And there's nothing you can do about that. But the vast majority of bad people are good people and they just haven't changed yet. And they just haven't had that eye-opening light bulb moment yet. And so that's why we do what we do. And we tell our stories and we try to show accurate representation on television and in movies and in media to change those minds and to show them that this is what trans looks like, to show them that trans is beautiful, that to, to show them that trans people are just people and that they have nothing to fear in a public bathroom aside from probably biohazards. That's so what it. advice do you have for youth activists? I think the most important thing, especially for youth activists, is whatever they do, is to do it safely. You have to take care of yourself. You are no good to anybody if you're hurt. Um, if you're in a community that is a lot more conservative and a lot more rural and, and a lot more bigoted, you do have to be much more careful and you have to pick your battles a little caref more carefully. And, and that doesn't mean that the work isn't important and that the work doesn't need to be done, but you have to take care of yourself. When my parents were always, their main focus was on me and Jonas's safety. And so for the first kind of part of our lives and the first part of this activism, it was focusing on, you know, trying to keep us away from media outlets. The media in the early days was very hostile and was really eager to kind of make a spectacle of it. And a lot of outlets, their first priority is to sell. And so it's all about doing what you can safely. That, that applies to everything else. If, if you want to come out to your parents, make sure that you are doing it safely and that you are not risking um, being thrown out of the house and you are not risking any, any other kind of harm. If you want to come out in school, if you want to come out to somebody, my advice is always to drop kind of, um, I call them feelers. What I would do when I first started coming out is I would kind of um, see what people's opinions are were like on gay marriage and, and other queer issues. And then if their response was positive, I could kind of mark that as a safe person and kind of be like, okay, this is, could maybe be someone I could come out to in the future. And if they weren't positive, then I was like, well, I don't want to be your friend anyway. As your activism progresses and as you become more confident in using your voice and using your story, you can start partnering with local groups and you can start partnering with LGBTQ resources because there is always work to be done in the community and there is, they always need more hands. And that is such a great first place to kind of start and see, you know, going down to, in Maine, it was a quality Maine. And, um, but there, there are local resources wherever you are. And so it is a great first place to reach out to them and just say, hey, I'm really eager in getting involved. And, and they will be, <laughs> they will immediately have like 50 things for you to do. So always keeping in mind that the most powerful tool that you have is your voice and your story. It is 
completely unique to you and it is a tool that nobody else has you your own unique experience is is completely different from what anybody else in the world has to offer and and that's why it's so imperative that we all are sharing our own stories and our own voices so we get as many different stories out there you're not going to be able to get your message out if if something happens to you so you got to be safe and you have to take care of yourself you always got to take care of number one and number one is me take care of nicole thank you so much for this